fresh oil from the throne. Hallelujah. 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 Fresh oil from the throne. Fresh oil from the throne. Anoint us today with fresh oil. Before me, heaven and earth, the 
They get so out of hand Well, it's then I am reminded I've never been forsaken I've never had to stand one test alone So as I look at all the victories The Spirit rises up in me through difficulty, God showed himself strong because God is faithful. Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand clap of praise tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Ushers, would you come tonight? We're going to receive our offering tonight. Again, uh, this Sunday is Mission Sunday. Uh, don't forget your uh, missions offering, uh, praise the Lord, uh, regular offering, tithes, glory to God, praise the Lord. You know, there's one time in the Bible that God said, prove me, and it had to do with giving. He said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain, glory to God. You be faithful unto the Lord, and God will be faithful to you. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you in giving. We thank you for the missionaries, Lord God, that you have laid upon our heart, that you've brought uh, through this church, Lord God. We pray for them tonight, especially for your anointing to rest upon them. And God, that you would use them in a mighty way. Bless the gift and giver tonight, Lord, we pray. Use your people to meet the need. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise the Lord. Glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm thankful for that 50 tons of air conditioning it is working. You may not believe it, but it is. Uh, this morning, I could tell I had Sister Snow turn it on last night. Uh, she said, I'm going to be up at the church late. Is there anything I need to do? And I said, oh, yes. Turn the air conditioners on. And so I come in here this morning. That one read 65. This one read 66, and this one over here read 68. And uh, But it was gone quickly. It was gone quickly. I know some of you was too cold, but uh, you thawed out quick. Uh, as we uh, got, God's been good to us and blessed us and helped us. I was helping a man this afternoon, has many physical conditions, and trying to keep uh, himself uh, to where he doesn't get an infection due to the to the things that he's had happen in his body. And uh, he said, if I could just get some help getting a place where I could get out of the heat for a night so I could take a shower and clean up. And uh, so we helped him to do that. And we've helped him before. But I tell you, we, we are blessed. We're blessed. God's been good to us and blessed us and helped us, and he knows exactly where we're at tonight. The presence of the Lord is in this house. Through the years, we've had the privilege of having several several interns that has come, been here with us. I remember some of the first ones I had. One of the first ones I had was Sister Jennifer Lee come home and her brother Otis. Otis is building a brand new church building in Cottonwood, sent me pictures they poured the foundation and and uh, doing doing well there and through the years had different ones that's come and stayed some have stayed in the church and uh this year as i mentioned this morning first time brother jonathan stayed at the preacher's house all summer so this week he stayed there upstairs with asher aiden and judah and uh it has it has been a thunderstorm upstairs i'll tell you but uh, uh, when I first met Brother Jonathan years ago, saw his demeanor and his spirit and his heart towards uh, leadership and authority. Not everybody, not everybody is trained and raised to respect authority and leadership. But thank you, Brother Wayne, for teaching your son, yes, sir, no, sir, I'll do it, sir. How do I do it, sir? You tell me, I'll do it. I like that. I like that. I'll tell you something else. God likes that. God will never ask more of you than what you can do. And uh, he is... He's worked hard this summer. He's been on several different missions trips. He somehow got acquainted with somebody in Ohio, and uh, but he's not let that detract him, praise the Lord, and is going back to school. And because of him staying and working with us this summer, uh, everybody that, that interns, we then pay their school bill the next year. So we will uh, send up the funds to cover his next year of schooling at OBI. And uh, he's asked me a lot of questions about pastoring. I leaned over a while ago and told him, gave him some more instruction, just as I would think about it. And, and uh, But he has been very attentive and very uh, respectful, worked with our youth. He's helped. He's been an example to our young people and faithful to go with me and pray. And I love and appreciate Brother Jonathan. And before he preaches to us tonight, I want him to come down here and stand between these altars. We're going to gather around him and we're going to pray for him. Because I believe that God is going to anoint him and use him in a great and a mighty way. And we need young men in 2023 that will stand for Jesus, with a backbone like a saw log that's going to stand up in the days of adversity.
Give us some men like Daniel that will stand no matter what the world says. That's going to pray. That's going to be an example. So, Brother Jonathan, would you come down here and stand between these? Brother Preston, come down here and get this anointing oil. You and Brother Kirkland, Brother Johnson. Come, brethren. I want the brothers to come. Come, Daddy. Come up here, Brother Wayne. Gather around him. We're going to pray for him. God's going to anoint him and use him. Who knows what God will do. Brother Robert Holmes was trained in this building. Different individuals that come through here that God's laid his hand upon. Father, stretch a hand this way and pray for him. Father, we thank you for Brother Jonathan. I thank you, Lord, like Joshua, that he has a heart to stay in the tabernacle and to seek your face. And I pray, Lord, that when the enemy would come in like a flood, may the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against him. God, that you would strengthen him and go before him, minister and meet his every need. Lord, that you would anoint him, that he would be a mouthpiece, and every place the sole of his foot shall trod, that men and women would know there goes one in whom dwells the Spirit of the Holy God of heaven. We believe in you, Lord. We thank you for his life. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless him. That you'd bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. Use him. Use him for your glory. Use him, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come ahead, son. Praise the Lord. Amen. I appreciate all the kind words uh, from Brother Snow. I, I feel like I've only been here for a few weeks, and that's kind of been a running joke with Brother Snow and some of the youth about my time here, but uh, I wouldn't have traded any moment that I've spent under this leadership and under uh, the, the charge of this church anywhere else. Um, I talked to Brother Snow and Sister Snow, and I believe I said it to Sister Kim earlier, that this, even it wasn't the full summer, but this time here this summer has changed my life in many ways and God's used the church and uh, the, our pastors uh, to, to mold me in this time uh, as I'm preparing for ministry and I'll be honest there, there came a point right before I came where I felt pretty beat down and wore out and I was like man do I really need to do this and I felt like the Lord just told me to keep pressing on it may be hard just keep going it doesn't matter I mean the, the things in your life uh, are going to be but a moment when you reach glory and when you when you make it to heaven. So I, I felt the, the encouragement to keep going. And when I made it here, immediately, the first Friday I was here, I went to youth. And immediately, I felt the Lord begin to, to start working in me. And I don't think he stopped just because I'm leaving here. But I, I know he's changed me completely from the moment I set foot uh, in youth that first Friday to now. I, I believe God has done a special work and he's going to keep moving. I appreciate everything y'all have done for me, your prayers and your support. And I believe in God to keep carrying me forward. And uh, I, I just want to say with all, uh, all that I can and from the depths of my heart that I'm so very thankful for each and every one of you. And I love you all so much. And thank you for this opportunity. But uh, just for a moment, I'll try not to preach too long. But if you want to be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 23. Uh, I was praying and seeking God for uh, something to preach tonight. I was pretty nervous. I haven't preached here yet. Uh, and I, I, I was pretty nervous, but I really felt the Lord lay this on my heart. And uh, I, I believe that God has a plan for this service. It, uh, it, it may not be this uh, Brother Snow preaching or uh, Preston or whatever, and I, I'm not the best preacher and I'm not the best orator, but I believe that God has given me a, a word tonight. Amen. For someone in, in, the, in this church that God really wants to change lives, that God really wants to do a work tonight. In Acts chapter 16, familiar story. Verse number 23, it says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, uh, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. 
And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Uh, But really quickly, I want to read that last verse one more time. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And uh, verse 26, uh, I forgot, it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, and I'll just stop there. But uh, if you'd stretch your hands forth tonight and pray for me. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I want to preach just for a moment tonight on peace in the prison. And uh, when I was thinking and praying and, uh, and studying and, and trying to, to find what God would uh, have me to preach tonight, I, I, I was drawn to this, uh, the, this thought of, of peace in a prison. And I was drawn to the story of Paul and Silas when they were in this prison cell. And, and I almost couldn't escape it. Uh, for a while, I was trying to figure out what to preach, and I just felt like, Man, I don't know what to preach, but when, when this came to my mind, I just couldn't get away from it. And, and I believe here tonight that, that somebody is in a prison, so to speak, that's not a literal prison, but somebody's in a situation that has you bound up, that has you locked up, and you can't get out, you can't see out. All you can see is the chains and, and the prison walls and the prison doors, and all you can see is the, the situation that has you bound. Amen. But I, I believe God is here and he, is, he has purposed in this place tonight that He is going to give us peace in our prison. And I believe God can deliver. And I believe God can set free. And I believe God can break the chains. And I believe God can uh, break the prison doors and can lead you out as He would do for Paul and Silas. But that's why I didn't read the rest of that. Because even in the prison, even where you're at, sometimes you have to sit there for a while. Sometimes the situation doesn't change. Sometimes your, your prison cell just does not open. It doesn't, I mean, your prayers, they reach heaven, they reach God, and God hears them, but your, your prison doors don't just open up sometimes. And, and, and I, I was thinking about this. Oftentimes when, I, when I'm in a, a terrible situation and, I, and the, it doesn't change immediately, I think, Lord, what a, are you not hearing me? What am I doing wrong? What can I change, God? Why am I not out of this? But sometimes God just wants us to wait and learn from the prison. And, and I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that, that Jesus is the true Prince of Peace and that He is the only one that can give us peace. And, and if we trust in Him, that even in the prison cell, we can have peace. Even in the storm, we can have peace. And I believe here tonight that God is, is ready to, to not, not... I mean, He may give a, a jailbreak for somebody and praise the Lord if He does, and I'd be so excited. But he, even so, I believe tonight that God is, is ready to do something in somebody's life where they're facing a situation that they just can't escape. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a broken home. Maybe it's some other illness or, or some anxiety or fear that He can deliver you from. But maybe He wants you to wait just a little bit longer so you can learn a little bit more or so you can have a, a greater testimony for the next person that comes along that needs some encouragement. But I believe tonight God is going to sow peace in your prison. Yes. Amen. And I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but uh, I, I was uh, when I was trying to think of what different definitions for peace and you look up in uh, just the random or the regular Merriam-Webster dictionary. It gives the definition that I really wasn't. I didn't really. That's not what I thought peace was. It was more of, of like a, a military sense of peace. But I, I found a definition, and, and it really struck a chord in me. And it says, "Peace is knowing that the Lord of the universe is in control and by your side, and not just knowing it, but it's resting in that truth. It, it is knowing that God." The God of the universe, the God that set the world in motion uh, those thousands of years ago, the God that created you, the God that saved you from your sins, the God that filled you with the Holy Ghost, He is in control of every situation, and you can rest in it. And I want to read, uh, and I, I believe that Jesus is the author of our peace. He is the, the Prince of Peace, and I believe it's only through Him that we can have peace, but not only have peace for a moment, that we can be kept in a peace. And in Isaiah 26 and 3 it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And I believe tonight that that is going to be a key to be kept in this peace. To be kept in the, uh, the peace that only comes from Jesus is that your mind is stayed on Christ. 
and that your mind is set to the Lord and it's not, it's not distracted by the things going on around you. And I read a story of, a, of, of two artists who were charged with painting a picture of, of true peace. And these, these two artists, uh, they were uh, given these canvases. They, were set, they told them to paint anything you want. You just have to depict peace. And the first artist, he, he takes his canvas and he starts painting. And he, he paints a carefree lad on a boat in the middle of a placid lake. And there's not a ripple on the lake. It's just as flat and as smooth as it can be. And this, this young man is just sleeping in the boat. And I would like that, honestly. I would like to be in a boat on a lake fishing. I, I love fishing. And that would, be, uh, that would be pretty peaceful to me. But it was, he was charged with painting a picture of perfect peace, of a real peace, a true peace. And so the other painter, he, he painted a raging waterfall and a tree overhanging uh, the waterfall right over the edge where it was just a straight drop and to all the mist and the stuff that came up from the waterfall. And, he, and on this, uh, this branch it was overhanging, he painted a nest a, and a bird in that nest sitting on its eggs. And the, the, the thought in this was that, yes, uh, uh, it doesn't look very peaceful. It doesn't look like a safe space. It doesn't look like the situation is in any way peaceful. But here the bird, this bird with her nest, was carefree from all the predators that could come and all the predators that were trying to attack it because it was resting in a peace uh, despite its situation, despite what was going on around it. And that was uh, the, what the, uh, the man telling the story said, that real peace is, is, not, uh, is not based on your situation. It's not based on what's going on around you. But it's remaining calm and cool and trusting in Jesus in the midst of a trial. And I was, I was thinking of different things that we call peace in this day because peace has become a rarity. Peace is almost extinct everywhere in the world outside of the church. And even in the churches there, there are places where peace, or where, uh, uh, where peace has become so rare that you only see it in the deacons or you only see it in the pastors and you don't really know uh, what peace really is. But I believe tonight that God is, still has the peace and he still has it for us today. But I identified some things that peace is not. And I believe real peace is not resting when everything is going right. I don't believe that's real peace. I love resting. I love taking naps. I love uh, not having to do anything. But that's not peace. Real peace is not feeling comfortable. It's not sitting on the church pew and never feeling conviction. Real peace is not feeling good uh, uh, just because everything's going good. Real peace is not just getting along with everyone. Yes, you need to have peace with everyone, but that's not just what real peace is. Just because you get along with the people that are nice is not just peace. But peace is, uh, but peace is getting along with people when you don't, or when you don't get along with them. When, you, when you're able to, to, to shake their hand, smile at them, and say, I hope you have a good day. I'm praying for you, despite how you feel about them. Peace is not determined by our situations. And like I said earlier, peace is knowing that the Lord of the universe is in control. And resting in that fact. And I read uh, a commentator said that Christ's peace is an inner peace that surpasses everything that the world can offer. Every, every uh, temporal thing, everything that the world tries to numb your senses with, Christ's inner peace surpasses that. Because yes, the drug may make you feel good for a moment. Yes, you may be able to forget about all the problems with a sip of alcohol. But there comes a time when all of that fades away. And you're faced with the same situation that you've been ignoring for so long. But if you take Christ's inner peace, it surpasses just your surroundings. And you don't ever come to a place when all this stuff hits you at once. You haven't been numbing your senses. You haven't been ignoring this problem. But you have been resting in Christ and you are taken to a, a deeper place in Him. Yeah. Amen. But I want to hurry up and get started on my first point. I, I identified in our verse that said uh, in Isaiah... It says, whose mind stayed on thee. That's how, that's when God's going to keep us in perfect peace because our mind has stayed on him. And so I was thinking, how do I get peace? I, I, when, I, when I was thinking on that, I was really not feeling very peaceful. And I was asking, uh, really, God, how am I supposed to get peace? Lord, how am I supposed to feel peace where I'm at? Lord, everything's going on, wrong around me. How am, how am I supposed to have peace? And I read this verse, and I, and, I, and I believe the Lord laid it on my heart for a reason. That it's keeping your eyes on Christ is where you begin in your pursuit of peace. It's where you begin when you're in the prison, when you're surrounded, and you're blocked up, and you're bound, and you can't do anything else but wait on God. Keeping your eyes on Christ despite the situation is where you begin. 
I believe we must have our eyes on Christ. We must set our mind to the Lord. We must determine on ourselves that Christ will be the only thing in our view in the prison. And that's the only way we're going to make it. Sometimes this is difficult. Especially when things are going wrong around you. Especially in the prison. It's hard to keep your eyes on the Lord. But we can look at Paul and Silas in their prison. I believe they understood this best because they knew uh, if, they would have, if they would have looked at the prison cell, if they would have looked at the chains, they would have gotten discouraged pretty quickly. It, it, they're bound, they're beaten, they're bruised, they can't move. And all, every time they try and twist or turn to get comfortable, it's hurting the, the spots they were beaten on. Amen. But Paul and Silas, despite everything that just happened, I believe that they looked up in, in the bottom of this prison cell and said, Lord, my mind has stayed on you. Lord, I'm setting my eyes to you because despite the situation, despite everything going on around me, Lord, I know that you are the only way that I'm going to make it through this. And I believe that from the time Paul received his sight after the Damascus Road experience forward that he kept his eyes on Christ, even in the prison cell. And I believe Paul and Silas were lonely. They were in a dark place. They were bleeding, hurting, forsaken, broken and bruised. Their own people rejected them. But their eyes were stayed on Christ. I've never been in a situation near that bad. I've had some hurt. I've had some pain. But I've never been in a situation where I was just beaten and thrown in the bottom of a prison. I've never been the, the most wanted guy in town. I've never faced anything like that for nothing. They, they didn't even do anything and they were in this situation. Amen. But they were still able to keep their eyes on Christ, even in the prison cell. And when they did this, after they looked to Christ, after they determined in themselves that no matter my prison, no matter my situation, I'm going to trust in Christ. After they did this, the prison, I believe, began to fill with an everlasting peace that only Christ could bring. And I believe that was a witness to the other prisoners around them. We read that, that, that the other prisoners heard them when they began to sing. And I believe that is because they had set their eyes on Christ in the very beginning and peace began to fill the place. Amen. No matter their situation, no matter what experiences, no matter what anyone else thought, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Christ. If I let my, my, my spiritual prison cell bound me up to where all I can think about is a prison, then my family will, my lost loved ones won't be saved. My family won't, won't be encouraged uh, by, by me. I will let them down in those areas. If I, if I only look at the prison cell, then I will never move forward in my walk for Christ. And I will just keep myself locked up. I mean, I, I believe that, as I mentioned, Jesus was given the name Prince of Peace. And, and I believe there is never a name given for God that isn't without reason and without a purpose. And in Isaiah 9 and 6, it, this is where he's given this name. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And I believe when God's given a name, it's not just a nickname. It's not like somebody calling me John or somebody calling um, my dad a nickname. I've never heard my dad given a nickname, but it's not a nickname. It's not just something uh, random, but it's because uh, that the author knew that, the, that this, this God-man that would be coming, that this uh, embodiment of Christ that would be coming, would truly be the, the prince of peace. He would truly reign over all peace and be the keeper of peace. And I believe that Paul and Silas in this prison cell were not ignorantly looking to Christ. But they knew that they had to get a hold of him and had to keep their eyes on him or everything would fail. Amen. I, I, we just came, it's been three years now, but we just came through a pandemic that had everybody locked up and locked down. And I'm not going to dwell on that very long, but I, when I was thinking of this, I was thinking that they said COVID was probably the worst pandemic of our time. It, it's probably the worst thing like that we're ever going to face. Amen. But I believe that fear and I believe that anxiety and depression and doubt has overtaken COVID in, in every sense. That yes, it may, not, it may not make you have a fever, but I believe fear can take you to the place where you're sick in body. I believe doubt can take you into a place where you're sick in mind. And I believe these, these anxieties and these attacks from the enemy have overtaken COVID in, in every possible sense and that fear really is the worst epidemic that we're going to face. That fear really has overtaken everything in our world and that this, the one place uh, of the church that's supposed to stand as a stronghold is beginning to fall to fear. I and mean, that's because the church is let down in having peace through our wonderful Savior. I Amen. Mean, but God didn't make it that way. God didn't make us to be clothed with fear. Christians aren't supposed to walk around with their head down. 
Christians aren't supposed to walk around beat up and bruised. Amen. We, we, may, have, we may have trials. We may have troubles. I'm not saying hide what you're going through, but I'm saying that we don't have to let our, our fear become our identity because our identity as a child of God is way higher than the fear that the devil can bring in our lives. And I believe if we can make up our mind like Paul and Silas that said, I may be in a prison cell, but I'm not clothed where I'm at. I'm clothed in the identity that Christ has given me. And I'm clothed in the fact that I'm a child of the king. And I'm clothed in the fact that I don't have to be bound up and beaten and bruised in my spiritual life. I can have peace where I'm at. And I believe fear may have bound some of us up tonight. And, and, and clothed us in a sorrow so deep and, and so painful. But I believe the Prince of Peace has already walked the building. And I believe he's walking it again now. And he's willing to set you free and, and clothe you in the identity of his children and of his, uh, uh, the adoption of his sons. I mean, I believe tonight that God has a plan and a purpose. But we must start with setting our eyes on Christ. We must, we must begin with saying it doesn't matter the disease. It doesn't matter the cancer. It doesn't matter any illness. It doesn't matter the depression, the anxiety, the pain, the broken home. It doesn't matter what it is. I, I understand it hurts. I understand it's painful. I understand that it doesn't make sense sometimes, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to look to Christ, the author and finisher of my faith, because I know that if I look anywhere else, I, I'll be so beaten and broken that I'll never return from it. Amen. We must turn our eyes upon Jesus. As the old song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And when, the, and when we do this, and as the song would say, when we do this, the things of earth will become so strangely dim. And there's a reason that the songwriter put it that way. Because when you look on Jesus, your situation and your troubles and your trials, they don't disappear. But they'll become so strangely dim that it doesn't make sense to anybody in the world. How are you still standing when you're in the prison? How are you still singing when your family's forsaken you? It doesn't make sense to anybody else. But it makes sense to Christ that we have, we have, we have let everything around us become dim because we look at the light of his glory. Amen. And I, moving on uh, to the next point, I was, my question was, yes, Lord, I know how to get peace, but how do I keep it? Or how do I, how do, how do, I do it when I have no hope? How do I do it when I don't see a way out? Yes, I can have peace when things are good and dandy, but how do I do it when I'm in the prison cell, when I'm in a storm? And I believe that once we do uh, uh, the first step in keeping our eyes on Jesus, we must do as Paul and Silas did. And they began to worship. It says at midnight, they began to worship. And I believe worship uh, and praise are, are so vital in our spiritual walk. One commentator said, worship and praise are a response to God's glorious invitation to lift our eyes to Jesus, our Savior, despite our feelings or our circumstances. And I believe that it, that is true in every sense, that worship and praise are, are, are receiving what God, the, the, the wonderful blessing that God has given us, that we don't have to be bound by our situations, that we have a, a, a Savior that we can look to in the time of need. And man, when Paul was in this prison cell, despite his situation, despite everything going on around him, he praised. And I, I believe that Paul was reminded of this when he would go on to write 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 9 through 10. It says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in the infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I believe Paul was either thinking of this or, or was thinking that he wrote. I don't remember when he wrote this. I just, I believe in my heart that when, when Paul was in the prison cell, I believe he was sitting there thinking, Lord, I'm going to worship you because I would rather glory in you in this current situation of a prison cell than glory anywhere else. I don't care what's going on. I'm going to worship you because I would rather be in all the pain of the world knowing that I am in your will. I mean, I believe we can make it out of the prison. We can make it through the prison, even when it's hopeless. But we're going to have to turn to Jesus and worship. Amen. Amen. I, I, I was thinking that worshiping is often hard in, in, uh, in a prison cell. Uh, I've heard uh, different people tell of how Paul and Silas might have been in this prison cell. They say the prison cell was at the deepest depths of the prison. It, it was at the bottom because they were, they were such valuable uh, inmates that they put them down in the depths where there was probably not very much light. Probably all the diseases and, and all the nasty stuff from all the other prisoners kind of fell into that area. And I, I believe that that, uh, that that was a pretty rough place. And they say that the, 
the, that the change that had them bound even had their legs and their arms separated so they couldn't move around too much. And I don't know if that was true. That's just what I read when I was working on this. But that sounds pretty miserable. That sounds pretty hard. I would have trouble worshiping. But what Paul knew is that it doesn't matter how I feel. God is still worthy. And it doesn't matter what I'm going through. God is still worthy. And, and in doing this, Paul created an atmosphere of worship. And in this atmosphere of worship, Jesus began to, to, to pour out peace in this prison cell. He didn't let the distraction cripple him. He didn't let the, the chains you know, make him doubt God. All he did was worship. He said, Lord, you're worthy despite the situations. And I believe if we do this, if we'll start, we'll start with turning to Jesus and then begin to worship, then we'll have, we'll have a way to, to have peace when we have no hope. Amen. I believe that others thought they were crazy. Here's two men. They've been, they're not only in prison, but they're beaten. They're in the bottom of the prison, and they're, they're bound up in, a, in a, the most uncomfortable way imaginable. The other inmates, when they heard them sing, I, I believe they could hear them, and they were saying, what are those two doing? Don't, they're worse off than us. How could they have a song? How could they praise their God? Hasn't their God forsaken them? How are they still going? And I believe the other inmates began to hear them worship. And this began uh, to, to, to really create an atmosphere of questioning what is going, who do they believe in? How are they, how are they still praising? What is this God that they serve? How is a God, any God, great enough to be praised in the prison cell? And I believe that, that God used this moment of worship to be a testimony to everyone around him. And as I said earlier, sometimes God lets you stay in the prison. Sometimes God lets you face some trials and tribulations. And I believe it is for, for the fact that sometimes you need to be a witness where you're at. Sometimes you need to be a witness in the pain. No, you may not feel like you deserve it. No, you may not feel like it's worth it. No, you may feel like giving up. Uh, but, but, God, but God is going to use where you're at, to be a witness. I have been through things in my life that I never imagined I would go through. And I never could see how any way possible God could use it for His glory. I, I, would, I would cry out to God and say, God, if you're trying to give me a testimony, I really don't want it. I just want things to be a little easier, God. And I'm just going to be open and honest here. And I, I don't want you to look at me differently, but this is how I felt. God, I really don't want this trial. I don't care. Lord, use somebody else to reach those people. Lord, Lord, please don't use me. I, I'm hurting. And, and, and as awful as that sounds, that was how I felt. But this past, when we were in Vernon... There was a, the past, we were praying with some of the kids, and the, uh, the pastor had told us that some kids faced some things pretty similar to what I had faced in my life. And I never got to talk to the boy. I never really got to speak to him about it. But I, I, I walked over there when it was time to pray. And, and, and if the Lord didn't touch that boy, he touched me in that moment. Because I, I stood by this boy. I didn't know his name. I didn't know who he was. I'd never seen him in my life. First time I've been to Vernon. And I stood by this boy, and I put... My second my hand touched his shoulder, I began to weep uncontrollably, uncontrollably because I saw in that moment that the prison that I had went through, that the storms that I had faced were all made worth it. If I could just, if I could just be an encouragement to this young man, if I could just be a witness for what God did every time that I cried out to God asking him to remove the, this, this trial, every time I asked God to take this from me, it, it all went away. And I would never change anything that I went through in this life if I could just reach one person with the same situation that I've been through for Christ. And I believe that is why God has put some of you through the prison. If you are questioning, Lord, why am I here? I believe it is for the sole purpose that God is going to use you to reach someone. And you may not feel like it's worth it. Amen. But it will be when you have the chance. Everything you've been through will seem like nothing the second you have a chance to speak for the Lord. And I believe Paul and si that God used Paul and Silas' worship to do this very thing. Now, I don't believe the prisoners sat silent. I believe some of them began to mock and to hoop and to holler and say, you're crazy, you're loony, what are you doing? You're forsaken, you're left alone. But Paul and Silas made it up in their mind. I'm not looking away from you, Lord. I'm going to keep worshiping. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think. 
They may holler. They may try and get you to stop. They may try and say your praise isn't reaching God. Obviously, he's forsaken you. But if you could worship in your prison, uh, hell will begin to tremble. Amen. Because when somebody makes up in their mind, you know, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. God is still worthy. Nothing Nothing will scare Satan more than that. Nothing will send demons running uh, like that. When you make up in your mind that Jesus is more worthy than, than the pain I'm going through. And I believe tonight that is what it's going to take for us to say, I'm going to stand, I'm going to look to Jesus, and I'm going to worship. Because you know it doesn't matter what I feel right now. Because there will be a day where all the sorrow and the pain will be cast away and I will be in the presence of my Savior. Amen. It may seem impossible to worship while you're in the prison, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Lastly, I want to just look at how to keep it. Because, you know, when the Lord, I believe the Lord was speaking this to me. I, I didn't just write this up to preach it to y'all. I feel like the Lord preached it to me because when I, when I was doing this, when I was working on this, I needed it. I, I, needed, I needed what I was writing down. I didn't, I didn't want it at the time. I wanted, I wanted freedom from what I was going through, but I needed what God was going to speak. And I believe this last point was I questioned God. Yes, God, I can worship in the prison now, but how do I keep going? How do I keep this peace? And I believe the key fact in that is believing in his promises. We read in Isaiah, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Not thou wilt give him perfect peace. Not that will provide. It's go, he's going to keep you. God doesn't start something and leave you alone to finish it. God always finishes what he starts. And you may be wondering in this place tonight, how am I going to keep peace? And you may be thinking even Peter couldn't uh, keep the peace. Even Peter couldn't let his, uh, make it past his circumstances. He, he let his circumstances overwhelm him. How am I going to do it? He saw Jesus heal. And I believe that the way we're going to do this, the way we're going to keep going is we're going to believe wholeheartedly. That God is going to keep us in peace. And he's not going to leave us. I, I'm here to tell you that, this, that Satan might have been sowing doubt and fear into your life. But God has sent me with a message tonight. That he wants to, he wants to bring peace even in the prison. Yeah. Amen. We, we don't have to take what the enemy puts on us. He may be sowing doubt and fear. He may be trying to, he may be saying, hey, hey Jonathan, but put this coat of fear on. You know, you don't know what's coming up. You don't know. You, God hasn't moved the way you thought he should have. You, 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 this is not what you planned, Jonathan. You thought you had a victory, Jonathan. And I believe that, that, that Satan has been doing this, not only in me, uh, but in, in, uh, in others here tonight, that Satan has been trying to, to identify you. But as I said earlier, our, identify, our identity is not in anything of this world, but is in the sole fact that we are children of God once we accept Christ as our Savior. And that's the identity that I claim tonight. I don't claim the prison. I don't claim to be a prisoner. I don't claim to be an inmate. I don't claim to be bound. I don't claim any of that. All I claim is that Jesus is my Savior, and I'm going to trust Him through the prison. And I'm not, I'm not talking about any kind of name it and claim it stuff, but I'm, I'm only saying that I claim Christ. I don't claim any of the doubt and fear. You can, you can throw that coat at me, Satan, but I'm not putting it on. I've accepted my new cloth of glory, and I'm going to keep it. So tonight, you may have feel, felt this way, that you've been, you been identified as a, a prisoner, and you're locked up, and you're bound. But I want to encourage you that you can make it through, because the Prince of Peace is, is not just giving out a simple peace that'll help you in, for a day, but he's giving a peace that's everlasting, and it'll last you through and past the prison. I mean, it passes all understanding. It's not, you know, there's no way we could fathom it. It doesn't stop short. It doesn't quit too soon. But Christ's peace goes all the way. And I believe if you're here tonight and you feel stuck and bound, that God has a plan for each and every one of us. But we're going to have to trust in the Prince of Peace to go on. As hard as that may seem. Because it's hard for me. I, I'm a very, I want to, I like to know what's going to happen. I, I want to cease. I I, I'm a very, I feel like I just, I don't want to trust, honestly. If that's the best way to say it. It's hard to say it. It's hard for me to trust sometimes. It's hard to me, for me to have faith. As many times as God moved in my life, as many times as God has worked, it's hard to trust sometimes. But, but when I was thinking of this, I was reminded of, of what uh, a preacher had said in a sermon. I don't even remember what preacher it was or when it was. But all I can remember is if you could trust me for salvation... 
can't you trust me for peace? And, and, I, and I was thinking of this when I was writing this. And I, when I was writing this, I was drawn to tears because of this. Because yes, I, I believe that I'm a Christian. I believe that I'm going to go to heaven one day. And if the uh, trumpet were to sound right now, I believe I would go on to glory. Uh, but I, I, also, I also have trouble believing that Christ would give me peace. And I was convicted in this moment. And after that, God began to work in me. And, and, and I still struggle trusting. And I still tr- struggle having faith. But I believe God for salvation. Does anybody, who believes God that he saved you? That he set you free from sin? He drawed you out of the miry clay? You're not the same that you once were. You're a new man, new creation. I believe it. So it's time for me to believe that Christ can give me peace. It's time for me to believe that no matter the situation, God can give me peace where I'm at. Amen. If we can just place our trust and our hope in Him and, our, and keep Him in our mind and, and worship Him in this prison, then we will make it through. Because a prison doesn't last forever. If you're in a prison for the rest of your life, if your prison is cancer and, and, it, and it takes you to the grave, it's not lasting forever. Because we have an eternal Savior that has given us a hope beyond this life. So it doesn't matter how long your prison may seem to last. Amen. Christ will deliver you as long as you keep the hope and trust in Him. Amen, if we could just keep our eyes on Jesus, if we could just keep him in the focus of our life, our prisons would not be near as bad. Amen, if the music could come, I'm getting ready to finish. Uh, You may still have doubts tonight. You may still have troubles and and trials. You may still say, well, I really don't know what you're saying, Jonathan. I I I really don't think I can get peace where I'm at. You don't know my situation. I mean, I don't. I don't know what you're going through. I, I know what I'm going through, and that's really it. I, I'm, my sister's right there. I don't know what she's going through. My, my dad, I've been living with Brother Snow. I don't know what he's going through. I know some things that people face, but I really don't know the extent of what you're going through. But I want to encourage you tonight that Christ will never fall short in peace. I mean, I trust him for salvation, and now I trust him for peace because I know that, that he, I'm not worried about making it to heaven. Because I know he has me in his arms. And as long as I don't turn away from him, then I I can make it. So now I'm not going to worry that he's going to fall short for my peace. I read a story of a man. uh, It's been in 1973, this man in uh, the Dominican Republic, he was taking a stand. It's foolish, in my opinion. But he was taking a stand and saying, you know, I want to be be seen around the world. And I'm going to be a sacrifice for world peace and understanding and acceptance among men. And this man in the Dominican Republic, he said, okay, I'm going to allow myself to be nailed to a cross. And so this man was, he was, he was mocking God and saying that you didn't do enough to secure our peace. So I will be the symbol of peace. And so he allowed himself to be nailed to this cross. And he wasn't beaten. He wasn't done anything like that, but they took six inch stainless steel nails and drove them through his hands and this was all nationally televised they drove it through his hands and through his feet and this man he planned I'm going to stay on the cross for two days Jesus only stayed on there for a little bit but I'm going to stay on there for two days and I'm not going to die well this man had doctors monitoring him and he had all kinds of stuff making sure he didn't die but after only 20 hours this man in all of his false confidence had to get down off the cross because he can't take He can't be the sacrifice for peace. No matter what he thought, he had to get down off the cross. He cut his voluntary crucifixion short. And and because because of an infection he had in his foot. And this was super foolish to me. Because you can't do anything. You can be a symbol, but how long is that going to last? But but this man did this and he, he got down... 20 hours into his into his uh, stunt that he did and the newspaper the next day it's headlined all over the Dominican Republic said crucifixion for peace falls short and, and, and when I read this story it, it makes me so sad to think that we are in a place where people are, are saying I, I'll get up on a cross and I'll let them crucify me so I can be the symbol but I'm here to tell you today that Christ didn't fall short when he was crucified for our salvation and our peace. Christ didn't stop short. He didn't get down off the cross himself. He went all the way and he died and he suffered and he gave up the ghost for our peace. I mean, he went all the way. There was no newspaper that read the next day. Crucifixion for peace falls short. No, Mary and Martha weren't crying in the garden saying, oh no, the crucifixion fell short. 
They weren't, they weren't sitting there and just, uh, just overwhelmed with sadness because the crucifixion fell short. But Jesus went all the way. And I believe that there was newspapers that in, in Jesus' day that three days later it would have said, crucifixion was was null and void because he's walking around in the garden I mean he was once was dead but now he's alive this crucifixion for peace went all the way and I believe here today that if we could make up in our minds that I'm going to trust in Jesus as my savior and if I can trust in him as that I trust that he is my peace that we could have peace through the prison if we could all stand bow our heads and close our eyes I, I'm going to give a specific altar call that I'm just going to call us all to pray Amen. but I don't think the Lord laid this on my heart for, for no reason I think he put it in my heart because there is somebody in the house tonight that you are in a prison cell so to speak, you're in a storm, you're in a trial a tribulation and you, you feel like you just can't go on any longer, you've been so eaten up by the this, this situation that you don't know what to do and I believe Jesus is crying out saying I went all the way for you I have your peace in hand come and receive so if you're here tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed no, nobody's judging if anybody's looking they probably just want to see somebody receive the peace that they feel I, I believe that Christ has it in hand for you so if you're feeling bound and broken and bruised and alone I, I urge you to step out in faith and turn your eyes to Jesus and say, you know what, Lord, I can't do it alone. I'm not going to make it. I turn to you. I really, I'm willing to receive everything, and I'm willing to worship through the prison. If you're here tonight and you're struggling with that, please, I encourage you. The, the Lord is your author and finisher. The Lord is uh, the Prince of Peace. He has the peace. There's no magic formula. You're not going to come down here and say this, that, or the other. But it's when you call on the Most High God and turn to Him in, in divine worship and say, Lord, I don't care what I'm going through. God, you're worthy. Lord, and I'm going to trust you to keep me through the end. Amen. If you haven't experienced any kind of peace, if you're not saved, I, I never want to preach without giving a chance. If you don't know what I'm talking about, amen, all it takes is one, one, uh, one call on the Savior. You just cry unto the Lord, believe Him as your Savior. And then come down to these altars tonight. One last time, I, I want to give you one more chance that God, God has the peace in hand and He wants to give it to you. I don't want to, I don't want to keep you from a chance to, to exercise faith. But I'm not, I'm not going to wait much longer. And I, but I believe God is calling and tugging on your heart. Would everyone come find a place to pray? And, and if you have been through the prison, if you made it through with peace, I, I encourage you to, to put your arm around a brother or a sister and, and pray for their peace. Pray for them to receive a touch from the Lord. And I believe God is going to answer tonight.